As you know, uh, Dr. Hollinger uh, is announced his retirement uh, this year, so we're taking uh, many occasions this semester to celebrate uh, his 11th uh, year as our president. A central theme of his presidency, really of his life, has been the integration of his head, his heart, and his hands, and to encourage us uh, likewise. Uh, and uh, the title maybe of his most well-known work uh, is Head and Heart and Hands. Uh, he's taught us how to speak uh, and when to speak uh, in the public square on the really big issues of our time. He's taught us what it means to choose the good, uh, to develop a Christian ethic in a complex time not coincidentally the title of another very significant work of his. He's pastored on Capitol Hill. He has written on many of the controversial ethical issues of our time, uh, and, and one of them has been his national voice on the complex issues of sexuality, an issue of deep partisanship, as you know, in our contemporary culture. He actually teaches a course, if you didn't know that, here at Gordon-Conwell on this topic. Uh, and has written influentially on it, the meaning of sex, a framework for the moral life. There is no better and more faithful voice on this very critical issue today. And so welcome with me, if you would, our own president, Dennis Hollinger. Thank you, Rick, for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for coming out on a bitter, bitter cold day. At least it's not Minneapolis temperatures. <laughs> the theme for today is the beauty of sexuality, and I added a subtitle to it, even in a broken world. Whenever we explore issues pertaining to human beings, there are two major truths that we, from a Christian standpoint, that we have to hold together. And that is that we are wonderfully made and we are terribly fallen. Now, there are a lot of other things that are parts of our theological anthropology, other things that we could say about humans from a Christian standpoint, but these are two very foundational understandings. Wonderfully made made in the image of God, therefore set apart from the rest of creation with dignity and value. Uh, we are made embodied souls or ensouled bodies, it's sometimes termed, and that embodiment is pronounced good in Scripture. We're given the task of caring for this earth and stewarding God's good resources within the world. We are given moral responsibility for our actions, and we are given a possibility of a relationship with our creator. That's all the wonderfully made side. But there is this other side. We get to it pretty early in scripture, chapter three of Genesis. We are terribly fallen. In that fallenness, there is a distortion of God's good gifts, a self-centeredness rather than a God-centeredness, a self-deception in which we actually deceive ourselves about what is happening in our minds and with our bodies. Uh, there is a using of people for our own selfish gain rather than true love of others. And there is a placing of self above God relative to the designs of God. That's all part of the terribly fallen. And so as we think about the ethical issues in a complex world, whether they be sexual ethics or whether it be uh, thinking about uh, Christian faith and politics, we always bring these two understandings to bear. And they are clearly uh, very important in matters sexual. But it's important to understand that as we think about this issue today, we start with creation. Our norms, our ethical norms, our moral standards come not from the terribly fallen side, they come from the creation side. We recognize the fallenness and we deal with that in the midst of the complex realities, pastorally, in terms of public policy in the world, etc. But as Christians, our norms go back to scripture and we come back to this phrase, which I think is so important, 
that we are wonderfully made as embodied cells. And so the first thing that needs to be said then about sex is that it is a good and wonderful and beautiful gift of God. That's the most important thing to say about this gift of sexuality, our maleness, our femaleness, our relational capacities, and it's the first thing to be said about the gift of sex referring to specific acts of physical intimacy. And it entails an understanding that the body, the physical, the material side of life is vitally important. There are three great Christian doctrines that undergird this, both the understanding of the importance of the physical, material dimension of life, as well as thinking about the goodness of sex. The first of these doctrines, of course, is creation. I want to note that whenever Christians have moved away from the classical understanding of sexuality to what I'm going to call revisionist understandings, it usually entails a rejection of creation having any contribution to the moral discussion. You can find this in a number of books and in my ethics course that I'm teaching this semester. I'll go into this more with students who are part of this. But even a number of evangelicals who have gone into revisionist understandings regarding sex have jettisoned creation. To jettison creation is to tear apart the divine trinity. It is to simply lop off a very important part of the Christian narrative, which is creation, fall, redemption, and eschaton. And you don't get the rest of the story right if you eliminate the first part of the story. When we look at creation, we find some really unique things. You know from your studies in Old Testament that we have comparative literature in the ancient Near East. But one of the things that is distinct, and there are lots of things distinct in the Genesis narrative compared to those documents, but one is this little phrase that occurs after every day, it is good. It is good. It is good. It is good. Refrain after every day of creation. Well, what's good? It's not something soulish or ethereal. It's all very physical. It's a very physical creation which is being pronounced good. And included in that good creation is sexuality and sex, even pertaining to the natural world. We sometimes forget that. We as human beings engage in sex, but so do flowers. So do animals. So does all of the natural world. God built into the fabric of reality sexuality and sex, if you will. And we really get that in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 20 to 23. God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. And so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing which moves uh, about in it. And according to their kinds and every winged birds, according to its kind, and God saw that it was good, God blessed them and said, and notice, he gives the same command to the animals as he gives to humans toward the end of the chapter, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And so this goodness involves, the goodness of creation involves sexuality embedded in the natural realm. And then, of course, human beings are made in the image of God. And it's very interesting, isn't it, in that statement, chapter 1, verse 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And here comes the sexuality. Male and female, he created them. And then the very first command that God gave to humans, have sex. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And then you get to the end of chapter 1 of Genesis, and you have this summary refrain of God having created a very physical, material world, creating human beings, male and female, in his image, giving them the mandate to procreate, and you have this remarkable statement, God saw all that he made, and it was very good. 
All of this led William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury in the middle of the 20th century to say, Christianity is the most materialistic religion in the world. Fascinating. By that, he didn't mean materialism is love of money. What he meant by that is that of all of the religions of the world, Christianity, more than any other, affirms the physical, material, bodily side of life. Not only is this undergirded by the doctrine of creation, secondly, it's undergirded by the incarnation. Now, that may surprise you. After all, Jesus was not married. Jesus never engaged in sexual intimacy. But in the incarnation, God taking on human flesh, living among us, there was an affirmation of the physical, embodied side of life. That troubled some early Christians. They could not imagine that God would ever lower himself to take on a body. That would be insane. That would be sinful because a body is bound up with sex and sexuality. And so you had a heresy that developed called docetism that very simply said Jesus really was not fully human, that he only appeared to be human. But if you dissected the body of Jesus, you would find different goings on inside of him than you and me. Fortunately, the creeds got it right, fully God, fully human, and that's a very significant part of our theological understanding. You see, what the docetists felt was if Jesus was fully human, he would be a sexual being. And on that, they were right. Lewis Smeads, in a book written many years ago called Sex for Christians, Lou taught at Fuller Seminary for many years, wrote this about the incarnation as it pertains to our understanding of sex. He says, the body of Jesus, Christians believe, was a real earthy body of tissue and bones, glands, and hormones. Jesus' body had the same goings on inside it that ours do. Christian piety does not have to be nervous about the sexuality of Jesus. He was a male, and his masculinity shaped his human life from his hormones to his soul. God did not become a third sex. He did not become neuter. He became a male and lived among women and men as a male. It is true that Jesus did not get married. And this fact tells us something about the possibility of being a sexual human being without having genital sexual relationships. That the word became flesh, he says, is the gospel's absolute yes to human sexuality. A very important point. But not only is this goodness of the material and the goodness of sex affirmed by the incarnation, it's affirmed by another great Christian doctrine, the final restoration, the final consummation. And that is that in the eschaton, we will have not resurrected souls, but what? Resurrected bodies. It's very significant. Now, at first you may say, well, look, uh, didn't Jesus say that in the eschaton, there will not be marriage nor giving in marriage. And indeed, he did say that in Luke chapter 20. And that might seem at first glance to undermine the goodness and the beauty of sex and sexuality. But when we think about that a bit more deeply, we come to recognize several things. Number one, in eternity, there will be no death. And therefore, one of the main purposes for which God gave this gift is no longer needed, namely procreation. But second, and perhaps even more significant, that is, in the eschaton, there is union with Christ. That union is the ultimate union. As I'm going to point out in just a few minutes from now, the sexual act, the union between a male and a female, points to that ultimate union that we have with God. And therefore, union with Christ as the final intimacy is pointed to always in the sexual act, and the fact that there will not be sex in heaven means that, number one, sex is finite. It's not ultimate, as our culture sometimes makes it, to be, makes it out to be. But secondly, it pales in comparison to the final union towards which it points, namely 
that union with God. The other way of phrasing this is simply to say the wedding of the Lamb supersedes human marriage in this world. And so the eschaton does not in any way fly against the notions of creation and incarnation in which there is an affirmation of the goodness of the physical, bodily side of life and the sexual side of life. Now, all of this goodness is very important to affirm. And unfortunately, for the first 1,500 years of the Christian church, there developed a, a notion of asceticism that often worked against this fundamental doctrine regarding sex and sexuality. Asceticism, which was largely bought, uh, brought over from the Platonic and Neoplatonic tradition, evident perhaps most vividly in certain forms of Gnosticism, basically said that the body is at worst evil, at best simply secondary and unimportant. And so you had all kinds of statements. Jerome, for example, the translator of the Vulgate, once said the only good of marriage is that it produces virgins. And uh, you had developing somewhere around the third century going into the Middle Ages, finally condemned by the church, uh, the notion of a spiritual marriage in which people would take married vows, men and women would take a, a marriage vow, but they would never consummate the act in a sexual relationship. And if you were really, really spiritual, the man and the woman would sleep together in the same bed and never have sexual intimacy. That was seen to be the apex of true spirituality. I would suggest it was heresy. So all of this then leads us to think about the purposes of God's good gift and how we protect its beauty. If sex is a beautiful good gift of God, then it certainly raises the question, why did God give this to us? And I want to suggest five purposes this afternoon. The one purpose is quite spiritual in nature, perhaps best understood by Christians. The others, I think, are more universal in nature. And so that even if individuals do not accept scripture as a final authority, even if they do not operate from a Christian worldview and commitment, nonetheless, they have some understanding of these other purposes. And I want to suggest that the goodness of the gift is lodged in these purposes. The purposes protect its beauty, they pro uh, provide the ethical boundary markers, if you will, for sexual intimacy. Number one, the spiritual purpose of marriage. As I noted, the other purposes are universal, this one explicitly Christian. And it is simply to say that a longing for intimacy in this world is really ultimately a longing for God. G.K. Chesterton once made the statement that when a man knocks on the door of a brothel, he's really searching for God. Really interesting to think about. As human beings, we all long for intimacy. And by the way, that's why it is very important that the church provide mechanisms of certain kinds of appropriate intimacy for single people in the church. Intellectual intimacy, certain kinds of emotional intimacy, but not physical intimacy outside of a marriage. Wesley Hill's written a wonderful book on that recently on friendship and the way that throughout the history of the church there were actually uh, understandings, almost vows of friendship that were taken by people because of a recognition that we are created by God as relational beings, and we all need certain forms of intimacy. But we need to be appropriate in how we construe all of that. So the longing for intimacy is a longing ultimately for God. And sex in marriage, on the one hand, is a sign, if you will, of the triune God's eternal relationship. Now, this does not mean there's sex between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What it means is there is a bond of relational love. And if you take theology classes here at Gordon-Conwell, of course, you will talk about the relational trinity and its significance and its importance. But it means that 
when we engage in this physical intimacy, it is the ultimate intimacy between human beings on this earth, but in one sense it points to the ultimate intimacy between the triune God, a bond of love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Moreover, the sexual intimacy between man and woman is a sign of our union with God and Christ's union with the church. This is clearly evident in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, where Paul quotes from the, manda, the, the paradigm about marriage in Genesis chapter 2 and then applies it to the church. So that from a Christian standpoint, the physical act of marriage, sexual intercourse, is actually pointing to something that is very significant in the spiritual sense. God's union in the Trinity and our union with God through Jesus Christ and his union with the Christian church. That has led some Christians from what we sometimes call the high church in the Christian traditions, such as Anglican or Roman Catholic, to refer to sex as actually a kind of sacrament. It's not listed among the seven sacraments in the traditional church, but nonetheless, it has a sacramental kind of quality to it. So that when husband and wife engage in sex, they are engaging in something that is very sacred. Second purpose of marriage is, or of sex rather, is the consummation of a marriage. And here we come to this notion that we find in scripture, the term one flesh. I want to read Genesis chapter two, verses, verse, just verse 24. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is probably the closest we get to a definition of marriage, which is quite universal, by the way, in all cultures throughout all of history. Uh, three aspects here that are mentioned with regards to a marriage. Uh, first of all, there's leaving father and mother. That's simply a way of saying there's a change of status. Recognized by the community, recognized by the law, the man and the woman are in a unique, different relationship than they were before and friends, family members, society recognizes that. Second, there is commitment. They will be united together. King James, I think, uses the word cleave, and, and it's a Hebrew word that really connotes a, a kind of joining together in a commitment that is made. Later on, scripture will come to call this a covenant. And so when a marriage takes place, there is not a contract. We talk about marriage contract, but from a Christian standpoint, it is a covenant that mirrors God's covenant with us and our relationship with God. And then the third thing that constitutes a marriage is, and they shall become one flesh. This explicitly refers to the physical union. And here are a number of other verses in scripture where the one flesh language is used. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, it says that if a man goes to a prostitute, he has become one flesh with her. He's gone through the act that actually consummates a marriage without any intention of any kind of a relationship at all. So the one flesh language in these texts refers explicitly to the sexual union. And what all of this means is that the sexual act completes a marriage. That is, it is the final element following the change of status, the commitment, and then there's the physical union which now sets this uh, relationship apart from all other relationships. It's very interesting, by the way, that uh, historically, and this is still true in a number of states, in the United States, one could get an annulment which says the marriage never took place if it was not consummated physically. They may have gotten a license, they may have gone through some kind of a wedding ceremony, been pronounced husband and wife, but there was actually a recognition by the state that if there was not a sexual union, the two were actually never married. 
And so has a long historic understanding, which by and large we have forgotten in the modern world and we simply don't think about. But what one flesh means is that the sexual act completes, consummates the other elements of a marriage. Another way of thinking about this is that something profound happens in physical intimacy. It is the ultimate act of trust. When you abandon yourself to another bodily, it is giving of the fullness of yourself to that person. It really is the ultimate act of trust when you give your body to the other person. And it now sets this relationship apart from all other relationships. There are lots of things in friendships that we share uh, with someone that are similar to what we share in marriage. Uh, we, we share conversations. We share sometimes intellectual intimacy. Uh, we share ideas. Uh, we may do things together. You may even help a friend out financially. But the one thing that sets a marriage apart from all other friendships is that you give your body to the other. And in giving your body, you're giving your soul, your mind, your heart, your whole being. The sexual act is not just a physical act. It is a giving of the whole self to the other. It consummates the other elements of marriage. And every sexual act thereafter for the husband and wife is a continual affirmation of their oneness, a unique oneness set apart from all other relationships. What this means then is that sex outside of marriage is going through a consummating act without any kind of intent of a covenant relationship of marriage. A third reason God gave the gift Procreation. And I have to mention, this is a picture of my daughter and son-in-law and three of uh, the children. They had another one since then. They took literally Genesis 1.28. <laughs> Actually, that one wasn't expected, but he has brought great joy. We can't imagine life without little Hudson. I always love that picture of them. Just connotes the procreation so beautifully. Well, procreation is the means by which life on Earth continues. Not just for human beings, but as I said, for all of biological life. God built that into the fabric of the world in his good creation. And for human beings, God's design is that procreation and intimacy in a marital context be held together. It's very clear, I think, in Genesis 1 and 2, that the understanding is that children will come into the world out of this one flesh covenant relationship so that children are born into the world out of the most intimate relationship possible. The stability of this covenant commitment, uh, the deepened commitment that is there between the husband and the wife, and that we do not pull apart procreation from this element of marital covenant. Now, um, this has all kinds of implications that I get into in the sexual ethics class that a few of you were in, especially when we get into reproductive technologies, because we can make babies in all kinds of ways today, and it's totally divorced from physical intimacy and divorced from any kind of marital covenant. It's also interesting, in the United States today, 40% of all children are, being, are coming into the world outside of wedlock, outside of a marriage. In Northern Europe, the uh, percentage is much higher. It's uh, almost as high as three quarters of all children. I believe we pay the price for this uh, socially, economically, in many ways, though the guild of sociology is such that you can't even study it. And sociologists that have tried to, particularly one, a Christian at the University of Texas, basically got strung up a couple of years ago when he tried to demonstrate this fact. But it's simply no go. You can't even touch the subject. That demonstrates something, by the way, about self-deception. Even among the brightest and best in our country academically. 
There can be a self-deception that distorts thinking so badly that it simply eliminates any kind of rational, positive pursuit of truth. The procreation element is certainly affirmed right from the get-go. I said uh, a while ago it was the first command, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth. Now, I don't mean, believe this means that every couple must intend to have children, but what we must recognize, recognize is that the marital act is by its nature procreative. And so if you engage in an act of sex, you must be willing to assume the potential fruit that comes from that act, because by its very nature, it's procreative. Of course, we've lost sight of that today. The British sociologist Anthony Giddens says, the separation of sexuality from reproduction is in principle complete. Sexuality is for the first time something to be discovered, molded, altered. Sexually, which used to be, which used to be defined so strictly in relationship to marriage and legitimacy, now has little connection to them at all. We should see the increasing acceptance of homosexuality not just as a tribute to liberal tolerance. It is the logical outcome of the severance of sexuality from reproduction. And so it is important to understand that from a Christian standpoint, from a biological standpoint, from a historical standpoint, sex is inherently procreative. I do believe there can be a place for contraception. I don't have time to go into that today. You know that has been a debatable issue in, in the Christian church. Um, but uh, I'll spend more time than that in my class for a few of you who are uh, in the class this semester. What this means then is procreation always points beyond self in the sexual act to others. It's quite common, I think, today for a lot of people to say, well, this is simply between me and the other person. It's a private act. The reason the state has always had an interest in sex, if you will, is that it brings children into the world. It is, by its nature, procreative. And by lopping off the procreative element, as has been done so frequently today, uh, we really, I, I think, set ourselves up for a lot of failures in society, simply because we then do not recognize the inherent responsibility that goes with physical intimacy. Number four, sex is an expression of love. This is uh, clearly evident in scripture. The Song of Songs is one example of that. And let me just read uh, a few segments from the Song of Songs in the Old Testament. This is chapter two, verses three to six. Like an apple tree among the fruit trees of the forest is my beloved among young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. We've turned that into a little Christian ditty song about Christ and the church. I don't think it has anything to do with Christ and the church. It has to do with what it's talking about. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Chapter 8, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot sweep it away. What all of this means is that eros is not opposed to agape. It's true that the term eros, one of the three Greek terms for love, does not appear in the New Testament, but I think when we take the whole of scripture together we can say clearly that agape love is not hostile to eros, understood very simply as physical intimacy between man and woman in marriage. Sex is the most intimate, expressive way of saying, I love you. Now, it's the only, not the only way. And uh, guys, particularly, it's futile if it's not accompanied by the other dimensions of love. 
including listening. Some of us don't do a good job at. I include myself in that, by the way. Uh, but there are many, many ways with our spouses that we say, I love you. Doing the small things that we know really makes them happy, bringing into the life the things that they cherish. But one of the ways we say I love you is through physical intimacy. Covenant love yearns to express itself physically. And uh, one of the things I found when I was a pastor and would do pastoral counseling, and I, I usually would refer people on when the issues got complicated and complex and long term, uh, but one of the things I always found is that if a couple uh, was struggling in their marriage, usually the physical intimacy had gone out the window quite a long time ago. It was kind of a barometer of what was going on in the marriage in other dimensions. The sexual bond then expresses love and it also nurtures love. It's kind of hard to have an argument with your spouse after you've just made love. And so uh, love, we recognize then, is far more than an emotion. Even in the sexual act, it is a giving of self to the other, seeking their best, uh, engaging in those things we know that pleases our spouse. It is not selfish. All the other characteristics that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 carry over into this dimension of life as well. And then finally, there is the purpose of pleasure. There is a place for a Christian hedonism. A hedonistic philosophy of life is a self-centered, pleasure-oriented uh, approach to life. But there is a kind of Christian hedonism that understands and accepts pleasure itself as a good gift of God. As sometimes has been noted, and I think rightfully so, Pleasure is not the invention of the devil. And this is verified, I think, in a number of biblical passages, the Song of Solomon that I just referred to. But also listen to this proverb, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always, May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Young people reading that for the first time are often a bit taken back. That's actually in the Bible. But it points to the pleasure dimension. It's a rather interesting text in Genesis, the 26th chapter, verse 8, where Abimelech looks out, he's the, uh, the king in the air, he looks out his window, and he sees I, uh, Isaac and Rebekah making out, making love. And it actually uses the word, the NIV and other translations tone it down, but the word literally means playing with each other. Uh, Abimelech has all been out of shape because Isaac has just said uh, that she is what? His sister, okay? And, uh, so, uh, and he did that to save his own hide, by the way, uh, not realizing, of course, the, the vulnerability that that put uh, his wife into. But... Uh, the fact that you have these kind of passages in the biblical text are great affirmations that there is a pleasure dimension. And God grants to us many gifts in life that bring pleasure. Eating and leisure and other elements of life are pleasure as we accept them as good gifts from our God. Moreover, there are parts of the physical body with which God has created us that serve no other function than physical pleasure. In the male, the glans penis. In the female, the clitoris. They serve no other biological function other than pleasurable sensation. But it's important to understand in all of this, pleasure is far more than genital arousal. And by the way, secular philosophers have even noted that. Some of the utilitarian philosophers, when they talked about pleasure, uh, seeking the greatest good for the greatest number of people defined by pleasure, went on to try to restrict that in a bit and said, you can't just talk about pleasure as pure physical pleasure. And from a Christian perspective, clearly when we talk about pleasure in the physical intimacy side, it is a recognition of carrying out this act in the context of the other purposes, a giving of the total self to another,
not simply one's body. And in so doing, it is experiencing a deeper pleasure. Yes, the orgasmic finale is physical pleasure. But the deepest pleasures go far beyond that. Uh, the pleasure of trust, the pleasure of deep intimacy, uh, the pleasure of promise and faithfulness that have been made to each other. Unfortunately, today, our society is fixated on the physical side of pleasure. And one of the things that many psychologists are noting is that it's taking more and more and more to actually bring people pleasure in sex today simply because we've become so fixated on it. And from a Christian standpoint, we recognize pleasure is far more than just the physical. And so God's design is that sex be in the context of a covenant of marriage between a man and a woman in which the purposes of sex and its beauty can be held together. And that is only found one place. And that is in the context of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman. It's the only location which all five of those purposes can be held together. And so we recognize then that sex is good, but it is fallen. And there are distortions in a broken world that we need to note. There are, for example, physiological malfunctions, such as intersex conditions. Some of these uh, are mixed genitalia. Uh, sometimes it's actually chromosomal abnormalities. Very rare, but it happens. There is also, and much ado about this today, gender dysphoria, persons feeling inward disharmony between their physiological sex and their inward identity, hence the transgender movement of today. And then, of course, same-sex attractions. And addictions, addictions to sex, to certain forms of sex, and addictions to pornography. All of these call for love, empathy, and understanding. And that's really important in ministry to broken people today, to recognize that we must demonstrate understanding, empathy, and a great deal of compassion for people who struggle in any of these areas of life. But, and I emphasize this, they are not the ethical norm. That's why any of you that have taken any ethics classes know that I constantly make the distinction between Christian ethics and pastoral care. And what has happened today in many of the debates about sex is that the ethics has been reduced down to the pastoral care. And among some hard-nosed Christians, the pastoral care has been reduced down to the ethic thou shalt. And we have to recognize that they both need to be there, but they are not the same. The empathy, compassion, and love does not define the sexual ethic. And I think that's very important for us to understand. But if we wish to minister effectively in the world today without compromising our convictions and our understandings of our biblical faith, we need to demonstrate the love and the empathy and the understanding with folks who struggle. The ethical norms then are centered in God's created goodness and they are affirmed by Christ. And they're affirmed by Christ, by the way, in Matthew, the 19th chapter, where Jesus quotes from what I like to call the Genesis paradigm, Genesis 2, 24. It's in the context of Jesus discussing divorce upon the occasion of some who were questioning him. And Jesus replied, at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so they are no longer two, but one flesh, and therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. In the midst of all of this, let me just add this note. That when there have been moral failures, we must always remember there is forgiveness and there is redemption. Scars sometimes remain from our sins, but God always holds out forgiveness through Jesus Christ. In our ministry in a broken world, we can never forget that 
while simultaneously holding high the beauty of God's magnificent, wonderful gift. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dennis. We're going to have some microphones around the room. Uh, we're going to take some time for questions and answers. Uh, remember that we're live streaming, uh, and so welcome to those uh, watching from afar. Uh, by virtue of my standing behind the podium, I get to ask the first question, uh, and then we'll turn things over. You've given us a pretty poignant picture of sex, and, and really a positive understanding of sex. And I guess my big first question is, why doesn't the church talk about sex very much today? <laughs> probably, probably the same reason couples don't talk about sex. <laughs> I mean, surveys demonstrate that most couples don't talk very much about their own physical intimacy. I think what it says is that sex is such a personalized matter, mm. that it is something so deeply entrenched, deep within the fabric of ourselves, that it's just hard to talk about. There are probably other things in, in marriages, every, other things in our lives which are hard to talk about. But uh, I think beyond that was the asceticism that so mm. impacted the church in the early years. And I really can't emphasize that enough. You just have to say, and the church has many foibles, it made many failures, but one of the foibles and the failures for at least 1,500 years or so, probably a little longer than that, was an mm. asceticism that said marriage is secondary and celibacy is the highest good. Uh, and that, by the way, is actually what is behind, originally, the tune changes today, but that's what is behind uh, the Roman Catholic Church's insistent that priests uh, be not married. Right. The original reason for that was that marriage was a secondary good, not a higher good. And so I think that crept into the church. And by the way, it's really when you come to the Puritans that you get the most healthy, first mm -hmm. promising signs of the beauty and the goodness of sex. Besides, all, despite all of this language about being puritanical and all the rest. <laughs> uh, the Puritans in this part of the world uh, really had very, very healthy views about marriage and physical intimacy. Yeah. Some others, jump in, microphones around the room. Who wants to uh, ask the first question? So I think, whoa, sorry. <laughs> so I think one of the biggest reasons the church might have some misunderstandings about sexuality is perhaps a bad interpretation of 1 Corinthians 7. So my question is, how do we reconcile the goodness of sexuality with Paul's seeming preference for singles to remain unmarried? Yeah. Hey, first of all, uh, Paul is speaking of his own calling uh, at several places in the New Testament, being called to a, a life of non-married. But it's very interesting, in the beginning of that chapter, he actually affirms both states. And, and he says the marital state is good and the state of sex without marriage. Now, a lot of the translations, I think, really skewed the text. But if you read it carefully, what is there is actually an affirmation of both. An affirmation of a single state uh, in, in a celibate uh, life, as well as the marital union. Amen. But that certainly, you're right, has I think contributed to the misunderstandings <laughs> at times. Some other questions. You said that at the beginning of the church, that the church appropriated a, a lot of the views that distorted its understanding of sexuality. and. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear what are ways that you think in the same way now in our moment, we've uh, imported views on sex that we might not even second guess ourselves that are seen as assumptions in the church. A very good question. Uh, of course, we're in constantly imbibing at the culture, I'm afraid. It influences our thinking and our actions. And, and I think one of the things that probably has happened is that sex has been made actually almost more important in mm -hmm. our culture than it really is. It's a finite gift. It's not an infinite gift. And so today it's quite common, I think, among many people, not just young people, but 
elderly people. I, I uh, sometimes do these kind of seminars with pastors. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was actually in this room, I was speaking to a group of pastors. And I mentioned something about the struggle to young people before they're married. And somebody raised his hand and said, boy, in my church, the issue isn't the young people. It's the old people who are shacking <laughs> up and having sex outside of marriage. And that often happens uh, after um, uh, a person is deceased, uh, a spouse is deceased, and uh, people will actually engage in uh, promiscuous sexual relationships. And that's part of the culture, I think, impinging upon us with this notion we cannot be sexual beings without sex. And so I think today is just quite uh, assumed that if you're going to be in any kind of a relationship, for some people even in a friendship, it's going to entail physical intimacy. And I think that's one way the culture has impacted. Obviously, uh, the understandings that sex can be anywhere with anyone outside of what God has designed has impacted the church a great deal, and hence the discussions that have gone on with regards to same-sex relationships. Down here, David. One time a teenager looked at me and said, uh, when I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm thirsty, I drink. When I'm horny, I have sex. Yeah. <laughs> How would you respond to that teenager? <laughs> no, I, I, um, I mean, I understand that biologically. <laughs> but uh, again, humans have to recognize that in many spheres of life, we have to place limitations upon our innate impulses. And when you have a free-for-all kind of culture, it's not just about sex, it's about money, it's about a lot of different things where we simply uh, go on a binge indulging ourselves in whatever feels right at the moment, whatever pleases us at the moment. And I think for a young person, and, and if, I mean, there are many different ways to deal with it, dealing with it. I, I think for young people, I mean, I've, I've done, I don't get invited too much to high school groups anymore. Uh, I guess I'm too old for that, I don't know. But uh, I used to do a lot with college kids and with high school kids. And I would give these purposes of sex and talk about them very frankly in understandable language that a 16-year-old get, can get at. And it, and it made sense to them. So I think there's a need in the church to teach these kinds of things, to help them understand what a one flesh relationship means, because by and large, we don't talk about it in the church. Uh, but then also simply to help a person understand just rationally that we ought not to give in to whatever impulse comes along. Um, it's not healthy for that person to eat just whenever he gets hungry, because you may have a disorder, which means you're eating and eating and eating all the time, in which you're harming your body. Or you're drinking and drinking and drinking all the time, which harms your body. There are lots of kinds of things we give into the impulses that I think are detriment mm. to one's health, one's sense of selfhood, and their well-being as a human being. So I think that's the kind of thing that I would deal with if I was uh, working with young people today. Hi. Mm -hmm. My question is, when two people get married and have sex, it's not just a physical act. That they, What are your thoughts on literally two souls merging together? And so the importance of making sure you have two souls who are... Um, have not had sex with other people because you're literally having not just sex with that one person, but potentially sex with hundreds of people if one or both of you have had sex outside Because of, of the prior experiences yes. of the individual. So yes. your soul is well, literally being <laughs> connected yeah, it, with It's lots very more. important, I think, for people preparing for marriage to talk very openly about those things. And over the years, when I did premarital counseling, Marianne and I usually did it together, and it's always healthy, I think, for... Uh, a husband and wife to do it to, uh, together with a, a couple to be engaged in the premarital counseling. But we would ask them, you know, flat out. Uh, this day and age, most people are just going to be right up front with you about it. But I think you have to deal with that. It's also in uh, where forgiveness does come in. That doesn't mean there are scars. Uh, 
And I think we always have to recognize this. I talked about the forgiveness element, and I just very in passing meant scars sometimes remain. There are emotional scars. There are physical scars. Let's remember, sex kills people, mm. OK? STDs are running more rampant than ever, despite all of our knowledge of supposedly how to prevent them today. Uh, and, and so you have to recognize the scars. They're not only physical, they are emotional. And I think it's very important for a couple to deal with those and simply be honest. There comes a point, if you're going to have a good marriage, though, you've got to move beyond it. And there does have to be an acceptance of each other, despite the past sins and foibles, and, and to move on. Uh, and in some cases, I've seen situations where they're not able to move on. It's probably best that they don't marry. I, I, might, I must say, we talk some people out of getting married, by the way, in premarital, <laughs> uh, in premarital counseling that mm. we did, because you just recognized there were too much stuff going in there, mm. and they weren't ready to really make that full uh, commitment to each other in a covenant marriage. Amen. Chris. Chris. Hi. Um, I've heard an argument that um, the ethical norms may be set in creation, but a, a certain reading of the Old Testament, you could say that God turned a blind eye to one of the distortions, which would be polygamy. And some of the arguments are um, that uh, God may turn a similar blind eye towards um, homosexual mm -hmm. marriage today. Mm -hmm. um, and so just how would you respond yeah. to that Yeah, no, very concern? good question, Chris. God always engages people in history from where they are. And so beginning where they are, as God begins to reveal himself to people, does not negate his ultimate designs. It's very interesting. Polygamy doesn't seem to be too much of an issue as you move on throughout the Old Testament. It's very much in the patriarchal era, which was reflective of, of the, surrounding, uh, uh, the surrounding neighbors. And yet, the creation paradigm was still there, and it's very clear, I think, when you get to the New Testament, there is an affirmation clearly of monogamy. And I would say that in some of the passages like uh, the Habakkuk text of one flesh, uh, in, in that text, implicit is a monogamous understanding. Now, you do have the pastoral dimension. And I often talk about this in ethics class when I differentiate the ethics from the pastoral care. When missionaries first went to the continent of Africa, and they encountered polygamous marriages for the first time. They said, OK, you've got to give up five of those wives and just stick with the one. Well, it ended in disaster. <laughs> because in those situations, marriage isn't just be, you know, between individual and individual. It involves family agreements that have been made. And many of the times, the women had nowhere to go. Some turned to prostitution. You broke up families. It was catastrophic. And so the church pulled its head together and fortunately said, we got to think through this. And they, they reached a decision that first generation polygamous Christians could come to the table, the Lord's table. But with second generation Christians, there must be monogamy. Now, that was kind of the pastoral compromise, not an ethical compromise. The norm was still held. But it was a pastoral compromise in order to try to move people uh, as, a, as a body, if you will, towards God's design from creation. I would just say, uh, and, and I don't have time to really go into this, but I, I, I think it's so important. One of my uh, uh, tasks over the next few years is to write a book on creation and ethics. And I've got about eight chapters outlined of things that are instituted in creation that are foundational to ethics today, not just about sex. It's about work, it's about creation care, it's about justice, because Sabbath and justice are linked together. Uh, it's all kinds of things, the whole notion of embodied self, the goodness of creation, all those kinds of things. And when we pull apart creation, those designs, right at the beginning, we really, really pull apart things that are fundamental to the Christian story. As Karl Barth said, you cannot have a command of God the Creator that is different from 
God the Redeemer, the command of God the Redeemer. If you do, you jettison the Holy Trinity. That's a very important theological point. A final question, maybe? James. Just for us singles, what is healthy expression of our sexuality that honors God? I, I think, James, I, I mean, our sexuality is very broad. It's not just about the sexual act. Um, there are those who are single who uh, resort to masturbation as an outlet. The issue of masturbation is not directly addressed in Scripture. For a long time, the church referred to it as the sin of Onan, where Onan is supposed to carry out the Leverite marriage. Uh, and he refuses to do so, and God judges him as a result. It says he spilled his seed on the ground. In other words, he, he practiced uh, uh, withdrawal when he was having uh, sex with a woman because he didn't want to actually bear children uh, to his deceased brother's wife, which is called the Leverite marriage in the ancient world. Still practiced in some parts of the world, by the way. And... Uh, and, and, and the sin of Onan, I think, has nothing to do with masturbation. The problem with masturbation as a kind of physiological, physical outlet is that it generally involves something Jesus spoke again, and that is uh, looking at a person to lust after them. And so it's the lust factor in there. I think what we have to recognize, though, is sexuality is about relationships. I think the best way for single individuals to deal with their sexuality as a human being is to have good quality relationships with male and female. And I, I think that uh, this is particularly true, by the way, when we deal with the question of homosexuality. Uh, if we're going to ask homosexuals who cannot change, Wesley Hill would be an example of that. This semester I'm having my students read his book, Washed and Waiting, which is a powerful book and it's wonderful imagery, isn't it? washed by the blood of the lamb, waiting for his final healing in glory. I mean, it's just a great, great phrase. Uh, but the one thing that Wes and others came to realize as people who had a gay orientation but not giving in to the orientation is that friendships and uh, being with others is important. Some of you remember when Wes was here about three years ago, and one of the things I know from talking to him and people that teach with him is uh, friends and colleagues, uh, make sure he's never alone on special holidays. Uh, he's invited into homes once or twice a week uh, to meet that relational need in his life. And part of this goes back to the fact that we're created relational beings. We were not meant to be isolated individuals. Uh, the American hero image of the Lone Ranger, the individualist pulling your uh, yourself up by your own bootstraps, is not the right biblical image. And so I think key to this, and, uh, and, I, and I really say this to all of you as single individuals, is that friendship is vital and very, very important in life. No, you do not engage in the physical intimacy, but there are other forms of intimacy in life, in friendship, which are meaningful and significant and are somewhat a mirror of that ultimate relationship of the divine Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.